Um, so to start out with, uh, if you go to these links, um, you can actually interact with the presentation. So if I pop a link up on the slide, you'll be able to actually click on uh, the link on the slide and it'll pop open in your browser. Um, and it's not malicious or anything like that. It's just to be able to get like GitHub links and stuff like that. So that way you don't have to take pictures of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, see, the thing is that if I go to a conference and do that, then other conferences won't let me, <laughs> won't let me go there. <laughs> um, also, if you guys want to talk or ask questions, just go ahead in the middle of the talk, just raise your hand or just shout it out, um, either way. Um, so, as you can see, um, this is automating your red team infrastructure, or you'll see the reason why I said red ops later. Um, I love to automate. And uh, for red teaming, Kali Linux is normally a pretty default uh, like intro distribution to go ahead and start testing things out. Um, so my name is Elrius741, or Alex Rodriguez, either one. Um, so to start out with, who am I? Um, so my experience is uh, 40, I mean, four years. Uh, sorry. I'm not that old yet, um, <laughs> but uh, I absolutely love what I do. Um, I love where I work. Uh, I work at Secure Ideas. I'm a developer there, and I'm also uh, do pen testing and operations team or IT infrastructure. Um, we're a pen testing company. We do lots of web apps and network uh, pen testing. Um, if you want to ask me more about that, just I'll give you a card afterwards. Um, so the community, uh, Secure Ideas also has their like open source or open yeah open source title of professionally evil. Um, so I help out with that. Uh, I'm also part of the 49 Security Division, which is a club at UNC Charlotte or University of North Carolina at Charlotte, um, and that's where I learned a lot of my uh, pretty much everything about security before I'd gotten to work at Secure Ideas. Um, and then uh, another community that I'm part of in Charlotte that's really awesome uh, and has awesome connections is Chaha, or Charlotte Hackers Anonymous. Um, and if you go to, went to those slides, uh, you can just click on all those links and be able to go to their home pages. Um, so uh, before we start, just a quick joke. Um, so has anyone heard of DevOps? I'm sure there's been a lot more container stuff here at this conference. So. Um, DevOps is something that's been kind of pushed into the community a lot. Uh, it's got a really big push for it right now. Um, so after DevOps came out, they came out with a bunch of other names, uh, like ChatOps and DevSecOps. There we go. There we go, DevSecOps. Um, so I made the joke of, well, this is RedOps. Um, so, uh, take the pill and go down farther into the rabbit hole, Neo. All right, um, so now the actual presentation. So we automate lots of things in pen testing. Uh, we use different programming languages and scripting languages, Bash, Python, uh, Ruby uses in Metasploit, uh, Lua for nmap scripts, so just tons of automation in general, but there's not really been very much automation for your infrastructure. So, I mean, do you enjoy having the app get upgrade, app get update every month for Kali and then possibly something breaking. Um, that's not very much fun whenever you have to wait two hours just for everything to update. Um, so this is a talk to kind of address that. Um, there are tools like Vagrant and Packer uh, that are used for this type of automation to where you don't have to sit in front of your screen every time you want to be able to do a upgrade. Everything can be updated for you and then you can just pull down a fresh image, and then whenever you get done with a pen test, destroy that image so that way you don't have any residual client data on your machine, and then you can just spin up a new one with your all of your customi customizations implemented in that Kali box. Um, so that way you don't have to reconfigure everything. Normally you have to do like a snapshot and then revert the snapshot to make sure that there's nothing residual, stuff like that. This automates everything for that and makes everything a lot cleaner instead of having to do some hackery to get it done. Um, so there's also a tool called Terraform, and I'm not going to really cover very much about it, but it is a really awesome tool, and I'm going to show some links at the end of these slides. Um, 
to go ahead and talk a little bit about what it's to, uh, what you can do with it. Um, and eventually, if you get into red teaming long enough, uh, you hear about uh, C2 or command and control centers. Um, and to have that, you have to have infrastructure created like in a cloud or on a home server or something like that. Um, so Terraform is to kind of help automate that. Uh, so managing essentially external infrastructure or even lab infrastructure. Um, so I know that for me, I've had to deal with a lot of manual uh, instructions for all of infrastructure stuff. So that's what all of these tools are for. Um, also, I'm a big Pokemon fan, so that's why Pikachu is on there. Um, so Packer is, uh, as HashiCorp says, easy to use, automates the creation of any type of machine images. And so what Packer is really best for is essentially creating what's called a base box. So you don't want to do heavy customizations that are going to, you're not going to need possibly later on. So if you want to install services or configure services in a certain type of way before you actually uh, use them, that's what Packer would be for. Um, so if you wanted to install Docker on Kali, then you can be able to use containers whenever you get into an actual pen test because Docker doesn't normally come in Kali by default. Um, so. Uh, that's what Packer is used for. It, you, it takes builders, which can be a whole variety of things. You can use VirtualBox, ESXi, AWS, tons of them. Uh, cloud services, on-prem services, um, provisioners, which is just shell scripts, Ansible scripts, um, whatever you want to use for actual provisioning. And then post-processing is essentially once all of that automation takes place, it will push your image wherever you want it to go. Um, so they have... Uh, as you see in underneath the Vagrant one, I saw uh, have Vagrant Cloud. And just to show you what that is a little bit, um, essentially, whenever people build images uh, with Packer, they can push them up to Vagrant Cloud. And so these are my Packer images, uh, or my Vagrant box images. And so this is the one that I'm going to be showing you guys how to actually do today. Um, and then there's all a ton of images out there. There's made by Canonical for Ubuntu, search. Um, uh, made by Canonical, by Chef, there's tons of images out there that are maintained by tons of people. Um, make sure that you always try and find well-known ones before going out there, um, just because you don't want to have like an incident where Docker, where people are just spinning up images all the time and there's crypto miner and doctor, Docker images in data centers. <laughs> Um, so definitely vet before you download the images, but um, as long as they're from a reputable source, then go ahead and you can use them for whatever. Um, and then these are just my uh, GitHub links to different config files, which we're actually going to get into that later. Um, so kind of just to review uh, as to what we're going to, or overview as to what we're going to do. Um, magic. Uh, to be able to automate all the infrastructure. Um, no, it's just using basic tools. And then uh, Kali, you'd be able to create uh, custom images, like I said, with Docker. Uh, you can install that beforehand, so that way you, you don't have to worry about the installation process of Docker. Um, and then you can actually use uh, Terraform for the environments for, like, I was talking about for home labs. You could do it if you want to test an exploit against, like, five different antiviruses. Just spin up all five boxes by running a uh, single command. It'll interact with like an ESXi box, spin all of those images up, and then you can run your exploit against all five and then tear them back down so that way you don't have to manually spin them up and then put the AV on there and then do yada, yada, yada. Um, you can just have everything pre-configured um, and just pull from those images. And so the potential is limitless. Um, so uh, normally I give this in kind of a a class setting, so these are normally the prerequisites that I uh, show people. Um, but uh, also, um, this is what we're going to be doing today. So I've actually created a script um, that creates a file called variables.json. And this is for all of your like sensitive information or dynamic information. So what this does is it goes out and it web scrapes Kali's website to find the most uh, stable version or the most up-to-date stable version. So whenever it transitions from 2018.1 uh, or 2018.2, it'll automatically detect that from their website because it'll, they'll update the link and then it'll just grab that updated link. 
Um, so you don't have to worry about figuring out the URL for uh, the most current version of Kali. Um, and then it'll also go through and uh, if you have, I'm still working on configuring uh, this part of it because not everyone has the same path to their credentials that I do. So if anyone has any suggestions. <laughs> um, so this will actually go through and grab your Vagrant Cloud credentials um, and uh, also what is it? The, oh, your username uh, for Vagrant Cloud as well. So that way you don't have to programmatically put it in and multiple people can use it because it'll just update with your username. Um, and unfortunately, uh, I'm not going to be showing you my Vagrant Cloud credentials and username <laughs> uh, or putting it up there because it's a video anyways and it's gonna be recorded. Um, <laughs> so I'll show you what that script looks like, but you won't actually get to see the token in there. Um, the username's in there, but. And then this part is for uh, versioning. So what you can do with Vagrant Boxes is have different versions. Um, and so I'm currently on my 0 .0 0.0.9 version. Um, and so you've got 8, 7, and you can do this as many times as you want to up in Vagrant Cloud, uh, as long as it's public and it's completely free. Um, so none of these tools that I've mentioned so far cost anything to use. It's just the time to learn them, um, which is hopefully going to be a little bit easier after this presentation. Um, so this is the uh, JSON template that everything is involved around. So Packard takes this JSON template and it converts all the different JSON data um, into what's actually going to happen to the machine. Um, real quick, does anyone have any questions so far? Okay. Um, so you can see uh, I've got what type of builder I'm going to be building it on VirtualBox taking an ISO. Um, so it's going to be a Debian box. Um, these are what are variables. So this is the dynamic information that I was talking about. So the ISO URL or the user ISO URL is actually defined down here as blank. And this is what's going to get fed in from your variables.json. Um, so all this dynamic information will get populated whenever you go to actually execute the build process. Um, so that way you can stick all these configs up there and not toss your token in there by accident. Um, you can exclude all of the important things. Um, and then uh, this is the provisioning step or the provisioning process that I have. So it, all it does is essentially go in there and run a bunch of shell scripts to go ahead and install different things, upgrade Kali to the most recent uh, packages for everything, uh, make sure that it's got VirtualBox guest editions installed. Um, and then this is the post processor. So this is uh, the Vagrant box that gets created. Um, and so a Vagrant box is essentially just an OVA or an OVF, uh, which is the hard drive or the export of a VM. Um, and it puts in some extra metadata into there. Um, so the Vagrant box gets created and essentially just has your OVA export in it, and that's what Vagrant ingests. Um, and then Vagrant Cloud is whenever it gets pushed up to the app.vagrantapp.com, which was all the different images of people that people make and stuff like that. Um, and then these are a bunch of different variables uh, that get used in the actual JSON. And the amazing thing about this is that you don't actually have to run this on your machine every single time you want this to happen. You could actually set this up on a server and run it headless and just have it on a cron job to repeat every week or something like that. And it'll go ahead and do the whole build process without you interacting with it at all. Um, so this is really nice because then you don't have to worry about executing it, making sure that you're staying up to date with the information. Um, and then these are just the scripts that uh, get executed during the Packer build process. There's quite a few of them there, and I actually took some from other people that were building Packer boxes as well. Um, and then uh, this is an additional Vagrant fi file config. Um, and Vagrant files are used for essentially like extra provisioning. So as you can see, I've got the memory, and that declares it beforehand. So that way, whenever someone does Vagrant up, they automatically get at least two gigs of uh, RAM. Um, of course, at least one CPU that you turn the clipboard on in case you want to be able to copy things in and out. Um, and then uh, 
Uh, this is actually used in another demo that I do. Um, and what I do is I spin up an entire C2 like network kind of, and this Kali box gets thrown onto that network. So what I'm doing is I'm declaring that this, uh, the Vagrant box that's getting spun up, gets a specific IP address on that network and joins that network. Um, and you can use this for a different variety of things. So you could say, I want to bridge the adapter every time that I start up this box. So that way you can do like air crack or whatever you want to do with that. Um, so Vagrant files are then for more configuring after you've exported that base box. Um, so now we're going to actually do, not that. Um, now we're going to actually do the demo. Okay. So this is only going to be the, um, the weekly version of Kali because, as I'll show you later, the actual full build process for a stable version of Kali um, takes about two hours. Um, so I didn't think you guys wanted to sit through that whole process. Um, so this is just going to be a short version. And then while this is executing, I'm actually going to pull up the video for uh, the stable version of Kali. And I'll show you at the end that it took about two hours to execute. Um, so I'm just going to execute that real quick. Um, and as you can see, it's downloaded the guest editions for VirtualBox. Um, and then it's also downloading the, uh, the ISO for the URL. Um, so and you'll be able to see more of this in the actual video, too. I just want to start this process real quick. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Um, for, the, for the scripts that you showed us earlier, mm -hmm. uh, is that a specific order those have to be run in? Um, some of them. And the only reason why is because some of them, like whenever you install VirtualBox Guest Editions, the host needs to be restarted okay. um, because it actually adds stuff into the kernel. Um, is, is it in the order that it needs to be run? In this JSON template, yes. Okay. Um, so. Depending on what you're provisioning, it'll need to go in a certain order. But f the way that it needs to go in now, it is properly format or in proper order in the JSON. The, but the, um, the, the scripts directory that you showed us on GitHub for a brief second? Yep, same one. Okay. Yep, that's all of this stuff that I'm showing you today is actually in my GitHub repo that I'm going to show you at the end of this. Um, so you'll be able to do whatever you want with it, pull it down, uh, submit pull requests, I'm open to anything. Um, okay, so while that's doing that, I'm gonna go over here. Actually. Okay, so this is the actual uh, full stable version of Kali uh, installation. And we've trimmed it down to about two minutes. Um, fortunately, I have an amazing girlfriend that is really good at film, so she helped me out a lot. <laughs> um, so this is like I was showing you before. Um, it automatically takes the URL that it get, you gave it and then goes ahead and downloads it. Um, and then after it downloads, uh, it essentially if anyone knows what pixie booting is, um, what it does is it creates essentially like a small network and then you feed it a file that will answer all of the questions that Kali normally asks you. Um, so it's starting up an HTTP server on that pixie booted network so that way it can give it that what's called pre-seed file um, to go ahead and answer all your questions for it. Um, so then it goes ahead, pops up. Um, the Kali installation, and then it executes what's called a boot command. And this is just more information to let the VM know where to go for the pre-seed file or the file to answer all the questions for Kali. Um, do you have to run on VirtualBox or do you run it on VMware? No, you can run it on VMware, you can run it on anything. Um, so there's even, you can run it on AWS and cloud uh, providers as well. Um, so this is the actual installation. Uh, so it just finished up. Uh, I skipped the whole middle part so that way you guys didn't have to wait. 
um, but it just finished up the installation and now it's rebooting the VM so that way it can then further provision with the shell scripts that I showed earlier. Any questions? So it's just rebooting. Alex, one question. Yep. Yes, but normally, so, well, you can't do it anymore, but if you're a student, you can get, uh, like, the ESXi hypervisor, and normally I believe that one doesn't require the play, paid plugin. I'd have to check on that, but, um, yes, I believe that the VMware plugin for Vagrant is paid, but they also might, if, you, if you're a student, be able to go ahead and give it to you uh, for free or something if you email and ask. I don't know about that, but... Um, it's possible. Um, so now everything's provisioned, it's restarting, or it's restarted and is now provisioning with Vagrant. Um, and so this is, as you see, uh, it said connected to SSH right here. Um, so that means that, let me just start it again. What am I doing? Um, ah, there we go. Uh, connected to SSH. So what happened there is Packer finalized the installation process and then now SSH'd into the already installed VM and is now doing the running all the shell scripts that I was talking about. Um, so it's all inside that little small network um, and is doing the install. It's doing an app get upgrade right now, update and upgrade. Um, so then after the installation is done, uh, it shuts down the VM and then goes ahead and exports the completely updated and customized VM that you have. Um, and then it converts it to the Vagrant box. Um, and this actually can be used locally. So say you don't want to push it up the Vagrant cloud, you can actually just have Packer push that Vagrant box image anywhere you want because you can run shell script commands afterwards. So say you're doing some type of automation for your company. Um, you can have everything happen and then run more shell scripts on your system to then push it or move it to wherever you want. Um, so it's not just limited to uploading to Vagrant Cloud. There's also lots of other providers that uh, have made plugins for it to go ahead and be pushed to all the other different uh, repos as well, or different platforms. Um, so it adds all that metadata and is compressing all of it now. <coughs> and then now it's pushing it to Vagrant Cloud which depending on your connection can be really slow. <laughs> so that's why I recommend... Oh, <laughs> no, <laughs> okay. So I said 42 hours because 42, everyone in InfoSec knows 42 is always the answer. <laughs> um, so not really two, 42 hours, but <laughs> I figured I'd get a reaction to that. <laughs> uh, but I mean, depending on your internet connection, it could because it's normally about four gigs of a file. So depends on your connection. Um, that's why, like I said, I recommend running it on a server that you just do headless. Uh, after you have everything provisioned. <laughs> um, so, as you can see, it took an hour and 41 minutes, and I had, I have a, re a decent connection. I don't have gig, of course, because that would be ridiculous if it took that long, but I think I have 300 down and 20 up. Um, so, I mean, it's a pretty average connection, so it took two hours, pretty much, to run that entire thing. Um, so, that's the video. Uh, and then I didn't run the variables.json for you guys. I'll actually do that right now. Um, so let's see. Let's see. Okay. Um, so that's the, I'll just cut it out. Uh, that's the script that I showed you guys in the repo. Um, this is to then take your information and um, plug in the dynamic variables that you need. Um, so let me tech re So let's see. My keys are fa or my hands are failing right now. Sorry. Um, so I'm going to execute the script and not show you guys my token. 
All right, so what it does is it adds a um, key for Kali Linux. Um, so that way you can, this script also does a verification that all of the information that you pull down from Kali's website, the SHA-1 sum, SHA-256, whatever you choose, uh, it validates that that check, uh, like the signature of that image is good. Um, so that's, what, that's why it has to import the key. Um, so then it says, all right, uh, please keep the similar formatting. The current version is 0 .0 0.0.9. So it just web scraped from my profile on uh, Vagrant Cloud uh, and asked or kept up with what actual version is the most recent version. Um, so then do something like 0 .0 0.0.10 and then it executes and uh, it has the ISO URL. Um, and like I said, I changed it to the weekly version for this, but you can literally just go in there. One second. I'll go to that in a second. Um, so then I chose 256 for the ISO checksum type. Um, and then there's the actual 256 ISO checksum. Um, and then the name that the cloud or that the image, the vagrant file gets uploaded to. And then the v VM version. And then right below that would be your vagrant cloud token. Um, but like I said, I'm not going to show you guys. <laughs> um, so uh, if you go into the script and say you want to do instead of um, the weekly build, you just come over here and just do current. Oh. Let's see. I think it's color scheme. Well, the colors are dark, so. Uh, I think desert. No. Here, actually, I'll just do it over on this one. This is still the uh, the weekly build. All right, so. Can you guys see that or no? This is actually my FreeBSD box at home. Um, it's on VNC, but all of the VNC stuff is tunneled through SSH. Um, so VNC actually isn't exposed to anything, just local host. Um, okay. Is that better? Yeah. There we go. Thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> it's pointless if you guys can't see it. Um, so set the Cali Weekly. And then from there, you just type in current. And then run the script again. Zero. Oh, wait. Almost showed you guys my key. saw the long string of characters and I'm like, oh crap, wrong <laughs> keyword. <laughs> um, so uh, now it's the most current version of Kali. Um, and I'm actually going to just copy that link and show you guys that it actually goes to there. Um, so there's the Kali SO. Uh, I'll go ahead and back it up one so that way you guys can see. That it actually visits there. Um, so it was literally just switch going in there and changing Kali Weekly to current, and it completely changed the output of what'll happen in Packer. Um, it'll build a completely different image. Well, it'll build it from a different ISO. Um, so it will take longer, but Kali Stable is normally better for long-term effects. Um, but 
just for this demo, it's going to be quick. Um, so I did the weekly version. Um, so let's see. All right, let's see where this guy's at. It's still updating. Any questions? Can you show us the uh, uh, your GitHub repository with all the scripts? Yeah, absolutely. I type it in so many times I know it by heart. <laughs> um, go ahead and let's see. Do you want the link? Is that what you're asking for? Yeah. Okay. So then there. Um, and if you actually go to the uh, the bit.ly bit.ly um, slash red ops you can actually see the slides and that's where I'm going to show you guys afterwards uh, red ops. Um, this is the actual presentation live uh, so this is I mean that's currently where I'm at in the slideshow and then once this is done uh, you can actually just click on down here and it'll take you to the slides um, and it has all my speaker notes and everything like that. So everything that I talked about will be up here. Just when it, remember whenever you do this, that on slide five, there's a down. <laughs> um, not very many people realize that, but there's a down right there. So you miss a little bit, but not too much. And then six, there's a down. So as long as you see that bottom arrow down here, that means that there's a down to that next slide. Um, so don't miss the information but um, this is actually the this slide right here is what I was going to show you guys next um, really quick I want to show you guys uh, so this is uh, Packers website um, I have everything all the links for it in the slideshow so whenever you go to the bit.ly dot or bit.ly slash red ops it'll be in there um, but uh, this is, it does a whole bunch of different providers um, and builders, so these are all of the different ones that you can use to actually build the image that you want to make. Um, and so, like, it's ridiculously long. Or if none of them meet your criteria, then you can make your own. Um, so this is completely open source by HashiCorp, um, which these are all tools by HashiCorp. Uh, they're really big into DevOps automation in, of infrastructure. Um, these are all the different provisioners, so Ansible is used there for provisioning stuff. It's a Python variant that Red Hat makes. Um, I mean, it's pretty much anything you can think of, they probably have something for it. Um, and then these are the post processors, so. Uh, can you make a Windows packer? Yeah. Uh, so Metasploitable 3 uh, is actually, it has a Windows version. Um, so Metasploitable 2 is normally what people are acquainted with, um, but Metasploitable 3, there, it's the new version, it actually uses Packer to build the image on your machine instead of having a hosted location. Um, it'll build it on your machine for you, and you can make customizations to it, and they've got the Windows right here. Templates. Oh, oh, that's not it. This one. Um, and what they do actually during the boot up process, I heard that the official terminology earlier this weekend, uh, it was called answer files. Um, and what you do is you pass in an XML formatted document um, and it answers all the information for you. So it's like the pre seed file for Linux. Um, you can do the answer file for Windows um, and it does all the customizations for you. That one I haven't documented as much, but there is, I heard about it this weekend, so that's why I don't have anything in my slideshow. It was before Detection Labs. Labs. This is supposed to be an already made Windows image for Packer. So it's called Detection Labs. 
Um, and I can add this into my slideshow afterwards. Um, but you can do Packer. And it's got a Windows 10 image, Windows 2016. Um, doesn't look like I have R2, but they've got two Windows images for you right there. Um, so you don't have to worry about figuring it out yourself because they've got the answer files as well right there. Um, oh, looks like they do have R2. Um, so yeah, it's, it's uh, apparently a really good repo. I haven't messed with it myself, but I was hearing it from one of my friends this weekend that uh, it's really good because he's trying to build out pretty much a DevOps automated lab, like how I was talking about earlier. And he said that these images are really good. And then you can just further customize it after you, you run all this stuff. Um, so that's all of Packer stuff. And then once you get the image built, you're like, okay, so what do I do with it now? Um, so then what you can do is the tool that I was mentioning before called Vagrant. Um, what you can do is just pull it straight down from, you can specify like which Vagrant image you want. And then you can, let's see, uh, let's see tabs. Um, status. Um, you can then spin up the VM. So all you have to do is type Vagrant up. And it, what it does is it imports, like it doesn't import like how in VirtualBox you import a VM. It does all that for you. Uh, and then further configures it based off of your Vagrant file. Um, so that's what I was talking about when I was, where I was talking about the C2 network. Um, it'll take that and then apply all those changes in VirtualBox for you. So that way you don't have to manually go in there and adjust everything. Um, so since the Calais image is about four gigs, it takes a little bit to import it. Um, but this way, the whole point of Vagrant is that you can Vagrant up and Vagrant destroy as many times as you want, and you have that same base image that you import. Um, so say you want further customizations, like say it's you finish the actual Packer build on Sunday and now it's Thursday, you can execute a shell script that says, all right, uh, in that Vagrant up process, run app get update upgrade to grab the most even more up-to-date packages, but instead of taking two hours to do the stable build, it'll take about 10 minutes because it'll be all, the only thing that'll have changed from that time is the actual changes from that week. Um, so it'll cut down immensely on your management time of having to import everything. Um, so that's taken a little bit, but um, any other questions? Okay, so Packer completely built out the VM, um, and it just stopped the Packer Auto Cali VM uh, for the weekly build, and it's getting ready to then export the OVA. Um, that export process is going to take a while, so I'm probably going to end the presentation before, or before trying instead of trying to show you guys that. Um, but uh, let's go back to. And I'll go ahead and pull up VirtualBox so that way you guys can see. Uh, so it hasn't, since it's still importing, it's not going to show up. Um, but once it finishes importing, which it normally goes a little bit faster after about 30%, um, this is a completely updated Packer image, or uh, image that I built from Packer. Um, so it'll just be spun up in VirtualBox. Um, also, there is documentation for Vagrant as well. Um, so uh, VirtualBox isn't the only one that... Um, so this is, go away Firefox. Um, this is Vagrant's documentation. So anything that I didn't cover, you can go to their docs, their documentation, and it's extremely detailed. Um, and then even if their docs don't have something, you can go to their GitHub repos, 
which those will have ongoing current issues and fixes for different releases. So since all of this stuff is open source and public, it's pretty much like you know exactly what's happening when. Um, and if there's a problem, you can submit an issue there and go ahead and ask for help. Like, hey, something's broken. Do And then they'll help you along through the process. They're really responsive. As you can tell, they've got almost 7,300 issues closed. So <laughs> they've worked through a lot of issues. Um, but let's see. You can also use Vagrant with Windows as well. Um, so say you build a Windows box, you can use Win RM or Win SSH to then essentially SSH into the Windows box. They've actually got a Win RDP as well, or a Vagrant RDP, something like that, um, that you can get an RDP session as well. Um, so Vagrant works with both Windows and Linux for boxes or VMs essentially, um, and can do the further customizations for you uh, based on what you need. Um, and then let's see. let's see. So this is the different things that you can use for uh, provisioning. Uh, again, it's pretty much the same set of tools that uh, Packer had. And then what you can also do, so how I was talking about the C2 network, is you can have multiple VMs inside of the same Vagrant file, and then you can do a Vagrant up, and it'll spin up all of those VMs for you. So that way, you can configure all of them just by taping in the code into the Vagrant file, and not have to worry about, as you spin it up, you have to go in and manually change and add each of the VMs to a private network, or whatever else you need to do. Um, we actually use that for uh, secure ideas for our um, our project called Samurai WTF Web Testing Framework, um, and you can do a Vagrant up and specify if you want a specific target to come up as well. Um, so you can then essentially do a pen test against that target um, and be able to learn different types of attack attacks by attacking another target instead of just locally on your machine. But it's all inside of your virtual box NAT and network or whatever uh, provider you have for your VMs. Um, and then an amazing thing for Vagrant as well is the shared folder feature that you normally do um, with VMs. Uh, instead of having to do that every time, Vagrant automatically adds a shared folder of Vagrant inside of the VM. So that way if you have any tools or anything that you need to pull every single time that you do a Vagrant up, you can stick everything in that slash Vagrant folder and then if you need to reference anything in that slash Vagrant folder, you can just go slash Vagrant and then the path of whatever you need to reference. Um, so say you need to install a license for a tool or something. You can have the license there and have everything execute to license whatever tool you're using um, in the Vagrant up process. Um, so my computer's not dying anymore, let's see. So, uh, the VM is up. Let's see if I can show you guys a better view. Screen size is not liking me right now. Goodness gracious. All right, it's not liking me right now. Um, well, as you can see, it's got the two gigs of memory. Um, Looks like I've got the process of, yeah, it's updating right now. Should have removed that script. Um, but let's see. Um, but their documentation is awesome. Uh, does anyone have any other questions? Oh, 
must have failed on the upload to Vagrant Cloud. Yeah. But all the versions that I've got up there so far have been built by Packer. It works. Uh, <laughs> and to show you the, yeah, right there. Um, so the actual Vagrant box got created. Um, if you look right here, red dash virtual box dot box. Um, that was the box that we created from the Packer installation. Um, so the upload to Vagrant Cloud didn't work, but oh, uh, you know what? I removed my token. <laughs> That's what happened. Um, so yeah, don't remove your token from uh, the script. Of course I did because of the presentation, but if you don't do the tech V, then it'll work. <laughs> um, but yeah. So that's pretty much the presentation. Let me see if I've got anything else. Um, oh, so that's my Twitter. That's my GitHub. Uh, like I said, if you go to that link, the bit.ly dot or bit.ly slash red ops, you can click on all these links and go to them. Um, so I always take any type of pull requests or comments you guys want to have on different repos, feel free. Um, that's where all my images are for Vagrant Cloud. It's pretty much just Kali right now. Um, so for my company, I actually uh, am doing a blog series on all of this uh, to where I'm going to go ahead and get to the nitty gritty of this. Um, so I've actually already done one article kind of just trying to get knowledge out there of um, uh, Vagrant and Packer. Uh, so you can go to the blog and read through this. Um, and here's kind of like the workflow of you creating the Packer image, uploading it to whatever you need to, and then pulling it down, and you've got your Kali VM on whatever operating system or provider you want to do. Um, so you can go there. I've got some resources. And then uh, also, uh, let's see. Let me go back to the slides. Um, so those slides, you can go to that or the bit.ly link that I was talking about, which I can bit.ly slash red ops. Oh, can't actually go to it. So that's the link. Mm -hmm. Um, if you want to get it. Um, and then, uh, so this is the links that I was talking about earlier uh, with Terraform. Um, if anyone's seen the uh, Red Team Infrastructure uh, wiki, it's a GitHub project that you can just Google, and essentially it talks about how to make your Red Team C2 network resilient. Um, and then defense, like make sure that it's secure and that it constantly stays, like it's really a really good infrastructure for the backing of your C2 network or your red team infrastructure. Um, and then Rasta Mouse goes through and actually does that with Terraform files. Um, so you can go visit his blog and he's gone through and talked about how to do all the different things that the Red Team infrastructure, or Red Team, Red team Wiki go, uh, talks about. Um, so I really like being able to apply things that people talk about or show, and then uh, being able to actually apply it. Um, so this is a really good uh, blog that I read through um, to actually learn more about Terraform. And then I actually met an individual, his name was uh, Mike Hodges, at CarolinaCon this past year. And uh, he's going and creating a framework to um, essentially help with masking C2 networks. And he's trying to automate the whole process of that C2 network. Um, and his project's called Hide and Sneak. Um, and if it, initially, he was trying to program all the API calls into his actual uh, project. And if the reason why that's not maintainable is well, it is, but it's difficult to maintain. Um, because if they change their API at all, then you have to go through and change your entire framework around that 
and update all of your API calls to then make sure that everything works properly. Um, but abstracting it away with Terraform, that means that HashiCorp will then maintain all of those API calls for you. And the only thing you have to worry about that with them is if anything in their syntax changes, which it doesn't seem to change very often, especially for Terraform stuff, um, because there's tons of companies out there. There's like, I've heard of uh, Blizzard and a ton of other different companies. I can't think of anything right now off the top of my head, but um, they all use Terraform to maintain their infrastructure. Um, so it's going to be probably around for a long time um, before anything goes away with it. Um, so it's pretty good to go ahead and uh, use in tools. Um, and it really helps with if you want to use different cloud providers, you then don't have to learn all the API calls. So he was initially doing it for, I think, AWS. Um, and I saw in the Black Hat Arsenal video that he also had, uh, I think it was Azure in there as well. Um, so he, in theory, didn't actually have to learn any of those API calls. He just plastered it on top with Terraform and abstracted all of that away. Um, so it makes essentially migration of infrastructure easier. Uh, so that way it's repeated in the same fashion. Um, any other questions? All right, I think that's everything. <laughs>